thank you everyone for coming. Um, I don't feel like I need to go through uh, much of my bio. Uh, many of you know me. For those of you that don't, my name is Tex Texan. I'm a globalization consultant and I've been doing this for uh, several millennia. Um, <laughs> Seems like. And today uh, we're going to address the topic of whether your global business is at risk. Short answer is yes. Mike, you want to add anything? Otherwise, we can go home. Um, <laughs> well, you wouldn't be here unless your business was at risk. So uh, we'll have someone at the door selling insurance policies. So um, this is a talk that we gave at the last Unicode conference. Um, we've updated it and uh, modified it a bit for this audience because I think um, actually the talk we gave for the for the internationalization folks was maybe a little bit junior um, and I'm expecting you guys have a bit more experience on the subject so we've kind of upgraded it a little bit. Um, and so I'm going to give you a few examples of the risk that you face and then the kinds of things at a very high level um, that you might be able to do uh, to mitigate that risk and how to think about it. Um, and then Mike is going to follow on with even a bit more detail. So does that make sense? Is that why you're all here? Okay. Um, what's that? I thought this was Toastmasters. Oh, yeah. How many of you are here for Bio 101? <laughs> um, and I was going to make another point, but... Oh, and uh, feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, I prefer an interactive audience. Um, so questions, comments, wisecracks, they're all, they're all done. Okay. Um, good. How, uh, you guys like John Oliver? How many of you no. saw last week's show? <laughs> so <clears throat> for those of you that didn't, I, I love John Oliver. And this was a last minute addition here. But last week, um, it's funny, Mike and I, when, when Mike saw the slide that I had, he thought I was going to talk about it completely different. Subject, so maybe he'll come back to that through the Q&A. <laughs> Different John but, Oliver episode. Um, so he brings up the fact that uh, IKEA is now selling these world maps. And it turns out the map is missing New Zealand. <laughs> and as it turns out, they're launching in New Zealand <laughs> at the moment. So, and he goes on for... for for five or ten minutes about, it, it turns out there are a lot of maps that are missing New Zealand. It's kind of a thing. Um, and he points to several other maps. And you know, of course, from our perspective, um, it has to do with, with quality and ensuring quality. And then if you make a mistake, and imagine having your mistake pointed out, both as you're launching in that country, it directly affects that country. And then um, also to have somebody like John Oliver hyping the issue and pointing out it's got to be really bad for Ikea. Although, by this point, it, it's such a joke. And the fact that so many other maps have the same problem, um, maybe it's not as damaging as it could have been. But I don't know if they contracted the map maker, um, a map maker, to do that. But the vendor of that map, um, that map has got to be in a lot of trouble. And if you think about it, yeah, okay, there's a lot of countries, but somebody somewhere should have had a checklist that said, United Nations says there's almost 300 countries. Do we have 300 countries or so on this map? A simple checklist might have helped catch that. So I, I think that's hilarious. If, if you haven't seen it, go to YouTube, find, find the story. But also, this is not specifically localization, so we'll, we'll talk about some other issues. Um, now, as, as you all know, the globalization is not a turnkey process, right? So a lot of people naively think, um, take some text, and I want to translate it, pick your language that you want to translate it to, and there's only one answer. There's just one set of translations. They don't realize the ambiguity. They don't realize um, there are many choices for how you translate something as well as issues of what's the voice I should use, what about cultural um, issues. And uh, so there, it's complex, there are many points of failure. Um, and even if you have a process that works, 
over time, that process can degrade. And we'll, I'll come back to that. We'll talk about it. Um, but the issue is you could have a process that gives you successful results, and then it turns out after a period of time it stops giving you successful results. So, and failure, as in this case, can be catastrophic. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, I worked for a company, and they said, the new version of our product, how do we brand it? How do we uh, get people excited about it? I know. I, I didn't do this, but the, the VP in charge said, I know. It's heroic. Let's get an example of heroes, and we'll associate that with our product, and then people will want to buy our product for everything it does. It's robust, it's strong. And they said, what's a good example of a hero? They said, fire them. They're strong guys. They rush into danger. They save people's lives. And so guys at headquarters made up all of these uh, brochures. And they said, our product's heroic. Here's this fireman. Now, at the time, I was working on uh, some of their product strategy. So I traveled around the world. I went to Latin America, I went to Asia, I went to Europe. And also, since I'm on the engineering side, I go into where the developers are, right? So I, I go to the marketing and sales guys, and I go to the executive room, which of course is clean, pristine, looks great. Developers are in a back, dirty room, and <coughs> all of the garbage that a company generates gets put up on shelves and it's all around the wall walls and you have to step around it. And I know this first stop I go to Mexico and there's all these boxes with brochures. That's our campaign. And I go and ask what's going on. So we oh, have a little bit left over. It's a little bit and it looks like every box we shipped you is up there. Is it no no you're mistaken. And so it takes a little while, I have to go out drinking and eventually I can talk to a couple guys. And I, I found the same story in Brazil, Asia, and Europe. I said, we can't use that. I said, why not? I said, well, why did you use a fireman? Firemen are heroes. They jump into burning buildings and pull people out to save their lives. Well, no, they don't. In Mexico, Fireman is the guy who comes, your house is burned down, he comes and he hoses it down, cleans up the rubble, takes it out. There's nothing heroic about it. <laughs> Three quarters of the world, his campaign brochures were unusable because culturally they didn't have the same image. So, now that's something that could have easily been figured out had headquarters taken the time to talk. Uh, to their field offices or done some testing. But, you know, this VP was all excited, had this idea, and they went ahead and did that. And if some of the people who worked on that watched the video, I apologize. Um, I didn't cause that, but I'm sure they wouldn't appreciate the mention. Um, so I worked on another product. And this one was a, a database product. And they distinguished themselves in the industry. They said, our product is an encyclopedia. Their competitors talked about having a repository. <clears throat> this was a big deal. They've been doing this for years. They come up with a new version. This was before all the manuals were in the cloud. Now the manuals are still being published, printed. And they go, um, they print up their manuals. And we get a call from the French country manager can't use it. The translation from English to French translated encyclopedia to repository. We've been telling people for years our product is better because it's an encyclopedia. We can't, we can't, we can't use it. One million dollars worth of translation, printing, shipping, thrown out. Now that's something I'm sure all of you would have said, well, Reviewers should have caught that. Um, could have easily been prevented. There, it turns out there was a review. Now, did the reviewers know what to look for? 
maybe they just checked the translation. It seemed like a good, reasonable translation. Um, they could have had a glossary. There are a lot of ways this could have been fixed. And so we see lots of examples like this. I'm, I'm not going to keep telling you stories. Um, but the idea is to introduce what kinds of things can we do in our industry um, to ensure these things don't happen or minimize the risk. Um, they could have had a glossary. They could have scanned the translation for terms to avoid. They could have automated some checks. Um, they could have injected known problems into the translation just to see if the reviewers catch them, to make sure the reviewers are doing a good job. And they could have had some metrics. How many words per minute are translators producing? How many are the reviewers reviewing? Does it make sense? Are the numbers up or down? Is there an indication of a problem? So there are many ways products can fail. There are many points in the development of the product um, where you can evaluate the potential for failure. And then, of course, I'm, I'm sure you all know, the earlier you catch a problem, significantly less expensive. It becomes exponentially more expensive to catch a problem, especially if you've done something like printed a million dollars worth of books, when you <coughs> could have easily caught the problem as a early <coughs> step in the process. Not only do you need to do monitoring, but you want to make sure that you're not just going through the motions. So you want to know that your reviews are reviewing for the right things. Um, having a review doesn't mean that they're checking for the right things. And you want to have some quantitative measures. Um, you all know the term KPI? Key Performance Indicators? Okay, so I won't, I won't leave with that. So, I'm sure nobody in this room will do this. But there are plenty of people or naive and think translation is turnkey operations. You get English, out comes the language. Especially these days where people have access to machine translation, Google Translate, Bing, other translators. They say, well, I'll put it in, gave me an answer, it must be right. <laughs> and they use it. Um, so we know that it's not one to one. So I'm going to show you some diagrams, <laughs> which I hope are obvious. And we'll build up on this. This is your process, input, output, no checking. That's not going to work very well. Next step up, and this is something that still companies do, uh, especially software companies. They leave their localization as a last step. They assume it's going to work. There's just a final QA. We did our internationalization, sent it out for translation. Translators must produce usable copy. We're paying them do that, of course it must be right. And because they only do some QA at the very end, they discover problems, maybe the problems with the translator or the reviewer, or maybe it was with the internationalization, making it impossible to produce a good translation, whatever the cause. This final QA means, well, it's better than nothing, but if they have to fix it at that point, it means delaying the schedule, right? Or um, if they may have to decide, well, we have to ship anyway, we'll ship it with the problem and fix it in the next release. And, and I see a lot of heads nodding. How many of you have been involved in projects like that? And the rest of you don't want to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, um, a better process is if you have continuous monitoring, which these little circles are more of these feedback things. Um, you catch the problems early on, it's less costly. And that's where you start doing things like checking your string and externalization uh, early on in the process, look for plurals and so forth. So you, you have this process, you want to also <coughs> test that your process is working. So I mentioned, for example, doing error injection. You do things like pseudo localization. You can provide bad UTF-8, bad dates and times, uh, interesting time zone switches. And you want to repeat this process. You can't just do it once to the beginning to say that well, my process is working now. Because that process can degrade for a number of reasons. So you have to keep repeating this. And because you're going to repeat it, you should automate the process as much as possible. Um, 
automate the testing, automate the data collection, and look for some kind of consistency in the results. Maybe you want the, the consistency and reliability of the results. It tells you whether your process is working the same way as before, or you're improving it, or maybe it's degrading. Quality de degradation happens for many reasons. Those of us who work with language and localization know that the meaning of words, meanings of symbols change all the time. Um, but also you get things, one term is quality pay. When you drive your vendors to have minimal profit margins, you're trying to get your vendors to be as low cost as possible, they look for ways to improve. And sometimes those improvements occur in ways that don't help your quality, but it improves their, their profit margin. That's one case. Sometimes you work with um, vendors who they think they understand what you want. And depending on how your contracts are written and the culture of the organization, some cultures they say, well, we want to show that we're doing a good job. We're going to innovate. We'll make improvements in the process. We'll make improvements in the results we give to the client. But actually, they don't understand the client's needs. So they make improvements, but the results actually differ from what you want. In some cases, instead of innovating, they read, your, they read the contract very literally. And in those cultures, they read exactly what's written. Now, Americans, Westerners, we, love, we write lots of contracts. They're long. They're wordy. But often, they don't say exactly what we need. Not literally. Right? They tend to communicate some kind of spirit for what we want. But another group, your vendor looks at it and says, well, um, it said here this is what they want. We will give them exactly that. And what happens is, later on, you come and you say, what happened? You're not doing what we want. And the vendor's going, it says right here, this is the type of performance you wanted. We gave you exactly that. They go, yeah, I wrote that, but that's not what I meant. So, happens for a lot of reasons. Um, language, language evolves. So, and we see lots of examples of this um, all of the time. I, I was interested in the last couple of days, because uh, I also work a little bit with fashion, right? And the fashion industry is taken to task. I'm sure you've all seen uh, the news reports about um, the designer who had a rope around his neck. Right now, the story from the designer's perspective, it was nautical. We had a nautical theme. It was about boats. It's a nautical knot and a rope. Two years ago, it would have been fine. We all would have said, nobody's going to wear a rope like that anyway. It's a stupid adornment. Lots of fashion is like that. There's things you ignore. All of a sudden today, a nautical symbol is actually a lynching symbol. No way. It's a suicide symbol. No, it could mean a lot of things. So things that were working only a few weeks ago now take on completely different meanings. So there are several other examples in the news lately. So, okay, so you have processes. But I would ask you to think about, is it really one process that you have? Is it just a localization process? And I would argue, no. You actually have a process for internationalization, for localization, for review. You have a process for translation memory management. Is that something you can just say, all right, somebody go tweak the translation memory? Do you periodically go through and clean up the memory to figure out how that is? How does that process work? Does that review actually do what you expect? What about many, many of you are using machine translation in conjunction with all of these other steps? That also is something you can't just set up. You have to periodically update and keep working on, right? So I would ask that you take all of these different steps, I won't read them all, and consider how are you going to monitor each of those? Okay. How many of you are doing that? 
Okay, some of you are. <laughs> no. Well, this, for the steps that you have, but a lot of, to be fair, a lot of companies, a lot of project managers would say, well, I'm just measuring the big picture, the overall localization. I haven't thought about, a lot of people don't even do um, translation, memory, review, and update. Right, that's one of those things that falls by the wayside. So it's part of the way you generate the text. So, you do this review, you want to start collecting data. You want to have quantitative values. Um, this gives you a way to have an objective comparison from uh, each use of the process. How did it compare with the last time? Is it going the way I expect? Good key performance indicators are also somewhat diagnostic. You can have lots of metrics, some of which don't tell you anything, just their stuff is done. Some of them will tell you that things are going wrong, but not why. Some data will actually give you some insight into what the possible cause is for a problem, and those are the, the best kind of metrics to have. It helps um, if you are transparent and publish the data. Because and then everyone on your team can see what's going on and can also um, see when they're making changes, car or even sometimes people make intentional changes, sometimes they make unintentional changes. And the fact that the data changes, the people who see that happening may be able to correlate it to something that they have done, which may not be really a little bit more publicized. Um, it helps. If you also establish maybe color coding or some mechanism that says um, these are in range, so you don't have to spend a lot of time on the data. Um, these are cautionary, they go yellow. Um, or, what, something went wrong here. These are a little bit more urgent, make them red or stand out in some way. Um, when you have this data, you can also do analysis, right? How are the statistics by team? How are, by the, how are they by code modules? How are they based on QA? How are they based, how do they compare with different phases of development? How do they compare with the urgency of the project? Did I have more errors because the schedule was crunched towards the end for whatever reason, right? So you can use that data and do analysis all sorts of ways. Um, how many of you do root cause analysis? Okay. Root cause analysis, the way I understand it, when you have a problem, especially a severe problem or a problem that repeats all the time, is you use the five whys. You ask, why did that happen? And you get an answer. Then you go, why did that happen? <laughs> And then it peels back a little bit. Say, so, well, for this reason, the translator made mistakes. Oh, maybe the translator was rushed. Um, maybe we cut out the review. You do that five times. By the fifth time, you start to get to the real underlying cause. Maybe it wasn't just schedule. Maybe it wasn't based on the individual. And you try and peel that back. For those of you that have been on the having to answer that question, it's incredibly painful. I just told you why. Yeah, okay, fill out the form again. Why did that happen? And you know, every time you ask, people are encouraged to come up with a better reason to, under, to look for more causes than what might be taken as the obvious one. So, we had a lot of translation errors. Well, how many is a lot? Was it 100 out of 1,000 words or out of 100,000? Was it that the translator mistranslated? Was it a delivery error? Was it a versioning error? So forth. Um, here are some examples of KPI candidates. How am I doing on time? Halfway through? We have about 10 minutes to the hour. We got about another 30 minutes or so. So 30, 40 minutes. I, I'm, I'm not going to walk through all these details. We're going to make the slides available so you can, you can look at it. Um, but there are some obvious errors that you would look at. Uh, you want to establish are these design flaws, process errors, 
Uh, were we doing code scans? Did, would somebody turn off some of the code scans? Um, do we have errors based on the type of development environment, based on the particular programmer who's working on it? Um, as I mentioned schedule. Training. The people who are having errors, did they attend the training? Did the training cover the kinds of topics that we're having errors in? Maybe we need to update the training. What's the coverage of the training? Um, do we have compliance with our process? We have a defined process. Was it followed in this case? Um, so, uh, support is a good one. Relating issues that once the product is released and you're getting support calls, tie that back to your development process and do that kind of analysis. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, who's going to talk a little bit more about dashboarding. So before I introduce myself and go into my part, um, any questions of text about the number of things and tracking and quality and so on? This is where you can root cause analysis my yeah, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so he only went through three of his five wives, so you can <laughs> Two wives left. This one over here? Yes? Wait for the mic. Oh, we have mic playing over. Wait for which mic? Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> the electric mic. The mic. Actually, I've been real static today, so I can be electric too. I have a question about the quality degradation and monitoring the process. So typically, a localization team, I think, support multiple scrum teams. So there are like hundreds of teams that you need to monitor. And a hun you know, a quality degradation can happen in any number of teams within the company. And how do you, I, I guess, like if you have any suggestion or advice on how you would work with other teams and how you monitor monitor their uh, performance? Well, um, you're going to do a mix of uh, looking through. You're going to gather KPI, like that kind of mentioned. How many words um, per hour are they doing? How many errors are caught by reviewers? Right. A lot of this is data that you can collect and automate um, as you go along. So even though you have a lot of teams, then you collect that data, and then you look for outliers. Data that seems um, different from what other people are doing. And sometimes that has to be scaled, because some languages you get a different number of... Oh, sorry, I'm, I was actually talking about like developers. I'm sorry? Developers and engineers. Software yeah, software developers. So I, I could take that one. <laughs> <laughs> we both can, but I'll let Mike talk. So with the software developers, um, like we have a training uh, for every single individual that comes to the company. We have globalization embedded in as part of the new hire training. And there's about four or five issues that always come up again and again and again. The biggest one is not using complete sentences in the software. Um, and the second one is not using proper APIs for formatting for the screens and things. And we found this again and again where uh, some particular team, and I found this in different companies as well, a particular team will start having spikes in the number of bugs that they have that other teams don't have, and will take a look and go, oh, there's been a high turnover on that team, and they have either contractors or others that have come in and haven't gone through training. And so we'll pull them, I'll usually have someone pull them aside, get them to the training, point out what's in place, and then emphasize the cost issue if they don't fix it. People say, well, that's not the project model. That's not in my sprint. It's not scheduled. Emphasize the cost issue that, well, if you don't fix it, then it reflects badly on the brand for the company, reflects badly on the usability of your product, and it's going to be all over the social networks. And unless you're doing international sentiment analysis, we don't know how badly it's being reviewed because you're only looking at English. And then we'll bring them, we'll reel them back in. But you have to do the root cause analysis. Why, why, why? Yeah. And why? so I think Mike is addressing kind of some systematic errors and some solutions to that space. But if you're looking for how do you detect it, then I think you need to have some metrics on um, how many strings are the developers producing, what kind of, how much code are they producing, which modules are they working in, um, and you have some scans 
that you can do. There are tools that will scan to make sure strings are externalized. Also, do the strings have plurals? Do the strings have uh, other kinds of grammar issues? And so you can scan for those things. I think actually um, one of the best solutions, um, you know, might refer to the example of developers that don't write sentences. Developers are really poor at creating user text. And you should take it out of their hands. <laughs> Quite frankly, the text should be designed um, by someone uh, who's a writer and an author, understands uh, marketing, and also understands global design. So they're writing text that is um, more amenable to translation uh, because it's easy to create text that's very difficult to translate. But that, that again, is that's a solution in that space. But detecting the problem, um, and detecting the, the source of the problem, you can automate, you have to think about what it is, what kinds of problems you're having, what can I look for, either educate the, you educate the authors, educate the reviewers, and if you can, look for automating the solutions. Right, you can pull all the strings out of your software and have that sent off to a reviewer to, to check. Um, not, you don't always have to just wait for, the, for it to be um, reviewed in software, because especially error messages are really hard um, for reviewers to access, because you have to execute, execute the software in some erroneous state, which is, is often difficult. Does, does that help? Thank you. Right. Okay. So I'll start with my introduction. So I'm Mike McKenna, and I lead the World Ready engineering team at PayPal, which is part of the larger, you know, the World Ready team. The World Ready team is composed of a content team that owns the actual source content, the localization team that does make sure the translation process is all in place and the quality of the translations, a content tools team which takes care of handling not just the localization process and the TMs, but also the content, the flow from the source content through the localization, and the my team which builds the API infrastructure and the consulting back to the various product teams. I've been doing globalization uh, for a long time. Um, <laughs> uh, Tex and I actually used to do a few consulting gigs in the early the knots of this century, and we've known each other, I won't say how much longer before that. Um, so I've been doing globalization longer, about the same time as probably the average age in this room. So <laughs> I've had a bit of uh, experience in this. So this next part we're going into is your company at risk. So most of the software industry is moved to an agile development model. And what I have displayed up here comes from what's called a RUP, the Rational Unified Process. Um, we don't necessarily use this at my current company, but it helps to illustrate that there are different phases to a product. You have to define what it is that you're building, determine what the customer actually needs, be able to define what the requirements are for your product, build your product, test your product, get your product released. And the way this one illustrates it is each one of these vertical bars is like an epic that's composed of multiple sprints. So in the Agile process, you, um, get, you agree that you're going to produce a certain product in a certain amount of time, and you define it, break it down into the definable chunks, and then you iterate for each, pro each um, sprint or so. So instead of saying, I have a deadline, I'm going to release a certain date, you say, I have a product I'm working on, I want to have the best product. And I have release dates, and whatever's ready at that date, that's what we release, and continue with additional trains of um, product features and so on. And each feature or each product may follow a similar model to this. Um, but then where does, globalization fit in? Where does your job fit in? Where does our industry fit in? So if you switch that around a bit, same process, same products, same features, but now you have the concept that you have a global strategy that ties in. You're not building a product strategy, but you have a global strategy that should tie in as part of that. As you're building a product requirements, there should be internationalization requirements in how the product itself should be built to be able to accommodate to different markets and different languages. You have the requirements ties into your design so that not just the software developers 
but the designers as well, who are designing the UI and the interface and so on, that they understand that the interface can change and get wider for European languages. You need larger fonts for Asian languages, etc. And then be sure your developers are using proper internationalization code, using standardized libraries and APIs to be able to build what they need. But you need to be able to test what it is that they're building, and you need to be able to test that you can localize the product even before you're localizing the product. So you need to have the different phases along the way. And then you need, the content gets localized over time, but somewhere out here you're releasing and you're getting feedback from the customer. And hopefully it's not the customer telling you the bugs exist, but your process is telling you the bugs exist so they can be fixed before you release. So then it comes down to what are the KPIs that fit into each one of these phases. So if you take that first phase, if you don't have globalization or world-ready uh, design, world-ready objectives from the beginning, then I guarantee you, you're going to end up with a feature or a product, as some of the ones that Tex had mentioned in some advertising and others, that just fall flat on their face in some of the markets that you go into. Mm -hmm. um, one uh, example from a marketing point of view is uh, uh, I would imagine that the percentage of you here that own a Chevy is pretty low, but those who do, there used to be a product called the Chevy Nova. And anybody know what Nova means in Spanish? <laughs> it means like no go. So it was a very poor choice for a product name. But the same thing can happen with features in a product itself. So one example is I used to work one company where we had a B2B auctioning product, mm -hmm. and as a business was winning its auctions, they were selling product to someone else, these little yellow stars that would come up along the way, and we're releasing it market after market after market, and then we start getting all these complaints from our vendors that we're working with in France, and we say, they say, you have to get rid of these yellow stars. We go, well, what's the big deal? So I do a quick search on the net, yellow star France, and the whole Holocaust starts coming up, where a number of people, for us, developing in the US, it's ancient history, it's in black and white. For them, it happened yesterday, and it's in living color. So we had to go back on the product and change what should have been found in the initial early stages so that the color's configurable. So the French market got blue stars, and the problem went away. But if it had not been made so it was configurable, it would have been a much more expensive problem to fix. So how can you measure this? So one of the ways is, um, simple thing is that, for like if you have multiple product teams and multiple uh, development teams and multiple features, that it's, are they actually considering global issues from the beginning? It's just a checkoff, something that can be held up at the director or VP level to say, these products are actually taking these into consideration. Also looking at, am I considering the regional support for the various areas that I'm going into so that I'm taking into consideration regional usability? So is it usable in the US? Do I have focus groups to test product ideas that I can actually test in Asia, Europe, Latin America? Because what I think of as a usable interface for communication in the US may be vastly different in an even more socially aware field in uh, Asia or Europe. Going to the next level down, where I'm making the product itself, I need to have global requirements, not just the feature requirements. So a feature might say that um, I need to uh, start a workflow to be able to execute a task. The international requirements, work requirements might say, I need to be able to start a configurable workflow to complete a task. Configurable means that how I do the workflow might change from region to region. For instance, if I have something in the US and I need an authorization for something to go to the next stage of a workflow, in Japan I might need five levels of authorization to have it approved. So do I have a configurable process? And then all the various things on how I do the formatting, how I do the layouts, um, do I have uh, KPIs in terms of my network performance? Am I going to regions that are going to have low mobile connectivity or high connectivity? 
I have various issues that I have to think about in terms of regulatory requirements. If I'm dealing with money, you're always dealing with regulations. If you're dealing with money, you're also dealing with anti-money laundering, which varies from region to region. If I'm dealing, for instance, going to Europe with the GDPR, I have to think about privacy. That may not be as big of an issue here in the US. I also have to think about accessibility, that you go, oh, gee, I'm only doing translation, but I also have to take into consideration that there are accessibility laws that are in place in Europe and Asia that can be several of the same as an ISO standard, but some are slightly different, so that when I hover over an image, do I have useful translated content for the image for a person that's visually impaired? <clears throat> I also have to think about um, cross-locale usage. So the example is, uh, other companies I've been at, and as well as here at PayPal, transactions take place from border to border. So when a product is created, you don't have just one locale. You have the locale of the user who sent something, the locale of the user who receives something, the locale of the person who's looking at the log, you have the locale of reports that have to go to a government. So you have different kinds of locales in different places. So requirements have to be taken into consideration considering who the audience is. Is the audience just an individual on an app? Is the audience a manager of a company? Is the audience going to be um, a government entity or all of the above? Other aspects of uh, assessing the risk is you want to have a KPI on this. Let's say you have a checklist on the requirements from a global level that it's taken into consideration at the concept stage, but am I looking at the regulatory issues, yes or no? If they're not looking at it, then it's something to open up as a potential issue. Another one is, in the risk, as we're going into the implementation phase, code can be built well, and go, code can be built poorly. So there are a few, not many, but there are a few, uh, really decent code scanners that are out there that work for a few programming languages that catch a large number of common internationalization errors and how they handle um, words and bytes and messages and formats and so on. Some of them don't work as well as some other programming languages, but there are various patterns that you know you should not look for and you should not be finding. So one example is uh, just uh, uh, as a question, how many of you are um, linguists or translation related? Raise your hands. Okay, so about half the audience. So of you that raised your hands, you know what good language looks like. And if you've been actually working in translation for any more than like three weeks, you've run into issues that have come from software where you've got two halves of a sentence, but not the whole sentence. And it's destroyed in some way. Well, you know that there's a pattern from what the original source English looked like. The developers can create scanners that look for those patterns. What does a string segment look like? What does a string uh, phrase look like? What does an embed string look like? They can look for the issues that you find as you go from the localization issues that go down to the source content that goes down to the software. You can build scanners to look for that. Other things that to look for are like embedded dynamic content. You can scan for that. Dynamic content that should be dynamic are things like a customer support phone number. You'll see that in the source content. It's written in the US and you have a 1-800 number to call which doesn't, you can't call in Brazil. There should be a local number that's in place. There could be links that are embedded in the source content to click here to get additional support, but it's going back to the US source page. Those are things that should be done in code to automatically configure it based on the locale that you're in. But you can look for those in the scanning phase for that range. So it's looking at the KPI is, am I doing it or am I not doing it, doing the scans? And then the number of tickets that could potentially be generated based on what you find in the code itself. And a little bit deeper down as you're going into the code and the test phase, the, scope, the code analysis goes through and finds a number of internationalization errors, areas. So one issue that comes up is you can scan code to find things that look like they're internationalization related. 
I'm going through code, I know where calendar things are, I know where date things are, I know where number things are. But if they're all registered as errors, the developers will stop listening to you after a while because a lot of times they're perfectly legitimate, they're writing logs to test databases, they're um, creating output that's going to be consumed by some other service. So what I try to do is say, well, where are the areas that need to be looked at and scrutinized, and is there a way that I can detect those? Take a look at those and then not have to look at them again once I've determined that they're okay from the code point of view, or to be able to raise them as actual issues for the developer team to take a look at. <coughs> Unfortunately, that looking at the code takes a lot of work. Um, that's why having scanners that are more intelligent helps a lot. So there, there's some um, software that's available that actually helps through with the scans and that, that for certain languages that are strongly typed, so Java and C++, it's a lot harder with loosely typed languages. Loosely typed means that I have this variable and if you want it to be a number, it's a number. If you want it to be a text, it's a text. If you want it to be a date, it's a date. So it could be anything that you want. Strongly typed is to say this is a number. If you try to put anything in it, it's not a number, there's an error. So it's, so it's a lot easier to find issues in that sort of programming language. But what we do, I like to do, is I use this doing the scans, and that tells you, in essence, how many areas have potential issues. So as you find the internationalization issues, then you can find the bug density. So why is that important? If you have a application that is very heavy on the back end, five million lines of code, but you only find three areas that are related to internationalization, and you find four bugs, then it has actually really high incidence of errors. If you have a UI application that has maybe 500 lines of code, and it has four errors in it, the bug and the 500 lines of code, and you find it's, let's say, has about 40 or 50 internationalization areas where it's doing internationalization, and it has four errors. Actually, this one, the UI <coughs> application has fewer lines of code, has a lower bug density. So if that makes sense, because it has fewer areas, it has more areas of internationalization, they're doing a better job on the front-end application than on the back-end application, which has um, fewer areas that are actually dealing with internationalized content, building reports and things. So that's important because if you know that, then you can tell how well a product is doing or not. So you don't just go, they've got over a threshold, they have 10 errors, they're, bad, they're a bad product, and you go, well, wait a second. They've got 40 or 50 engineers working on that product, and they have about 6,000 areas that are doing internationalization, we can help them and get them moving in the right direction, but it's not may not be as severe as you think it is, as opposed to another application. So it's how to set intelligent thresholds so you can be able to do tracking that makes sense when it goes up to an executive or leadership level where they have to make decisions if they need to, to pull the chain and stop the, the process going forward. There's various critical test values that you can stick into the code to help you identify issues. So, big one is boundary conditions. So there are various things that you can put in to see, is my product actually handling this properly? One example is date time. So if you have the transition December 30th to January 2nd, or the February 28th to March 1st, and walk through different regions and locales, is it making the transition correctly? Or if I have a calendar app, is it making the leap to the next year correctly? There's a lot of times, especially, I, I've seen this where an application is running off of server time, and the server is based in Silicon Valley or Arizona or something, but the user is in Europe time or Asia time, and you make a transition from around December 30th or so, and Europe is thinks they're in the next year already, or Asia thinks they're in the next year already, but the server is still in the previous year. So there's issues that can come up by putting these boundary conditions. And then you can actually test the applications from region to region, and you go, uh -uh, you've got this, you need to be able to take into consideration, as I said before, you've got multiple locales, 
the locale of the user, the locale of the receiver, the locale of the report, and so on. That takes into consideration when I create locales, any team I'm on, I say, so for those of you who have heard the term locale, it's usually what? Language plus what? Language plus country. I always put it language plus country plus time zone because that time zone has a big indicator of how your UI behaves and operates and so on. Um, another one is in data transformation. So when an application is going through and says, okay, we're going to make everything uppercase and we're going to move everything going forwards, you have things like the German sharp S. And when you do a sharp S, it looks like the, the beta in Greek, but it's a, it represents the double S. And when you do the uppercase, if you don't get the SS, then there's something broken on the system. The other one is if you go into Turkish, you have a dotted I and a dotless I, the, the I and the, U, the E and the U, I think it is, in Turkish. And when you do the case mapping from uppercase to lowercase, you should have dotless I to dotless I, dotted I to dotted I, which is broken a lot, I've seen in JavaScript applications and, and HTML apps. Apps. So you have to actually program it in and tell the developers you've actually broken this because if you change it from uh, uppercase something go from an e to a u, uh, the searches break, the person's name breaks, the meaning of a word can break or change. That's in place. There's other fun things. Uh, I just saw one today that showed up where old code encodings break in. So almost everything that you use is or should be in Unicode. It's either in UTF-8, which is several bytes in a row, or 16-bit, whatever it is. But the internal usage in JavaScript is all Unicode, or your database it should be Unicode. But sometimes along the way, things will break, and someone has used a Windows system, which uses these control, what are control characters in Latin 1, but may end up being actual characters on a Windows machine, like the trademark or the Euro symbol. So I saw one today where they're complaining about a spreadsheet that was automatically downloaded and it wasn't working as a spreadsheet anymore. And so I said, send me the raw data, pulled it up in a hex editor and found out that there were three strange Windows characters at the front, took those Windows characters out, converted them to their bytes and turned out it was the UTF-8 version of a byte order mark for right to left encoding, which then broke the numbers after it. But by injecting, so if we, whoever built this, had injected these codes in as part of the testing, we could have caught that and not have the customer catch it instead. Mm -hmm. So putting in boundary value testings. So I'm putting these in because this is, you know, words for me as well. Um, Tex has a site called ietananguy.com for the internationalization guy, that's Tex. And he has a number of different boundary conditions that you can use as part of your test methodology and ways in which to inject error, potential errors into your system. And then those can then be used to generate tickets and then have a KPI for the number of issues that are found during the internationalization phase and for error injection into the system. Other things that you want to put in as part of your testing phase is I always come back to it again and again when I see teams not do it again and again, and that's pseudo-localization. So pseudo-localization basically takes your English source content and does very minor uh, um, permutations to it to make it either simulate European text by making it wider or to simulate Arabic text or, or a Middle Eastern right to left text. You can do that by just inserting a single Hebrew character in front of every single word and they'll flip the direction of the whole string. And you can also simulate Asian text by putting in very complex, high-density Asian characters. And so that way with pseudo-localization, you can go through and check to be sure your application will handle the expanded text, small font sizes for Asia that it adapts correctly to different areas, and that right to left uh, encodings work and do all that testing before it ever gets translated. So a lot of teams will say, well, why should we bother with the pseudo-localization when we just give it to you guys who translate and get, we get it back the next day? And you say, the reason why is because there's a lot of errors I can't catch 
with the translated content when I don't know how to read that translated content. And so as opposed to pseudo-localization, it can be used. Uh, I've done it with a game company, and I know um, VMware is doing it as well. We do the pseudo-localization, and then you do screenshots as you go through the API. Screen after screen after screen after screen. Now with these screenshots, you can do optical character recognition on what's been generated to look for the patterns for what you all have seen in source content, for uh, fragmented strings, for things that start and stop. You can be able to find embedded content and so on through the OCR that's in place. Other things you're looking at during the testing phase is what a lot of the localization industry, the linguistic testing, are the words right? The aesthetic testing, does it look correct to the user, using the right words, tone, and so on? And then coming down, being sure that you prioritize what you find from, if there's a typo, perhaps you can ship it or you don't have to stop the product right away, but if it's a blocker or something that is going to be embarrassing or is illegal, that has to be caught and stopped right away before anything gets shipped and prioritized accordingly. So those become KPIs. So KPIs, things that you're looking at is how many tickets do you have, how old are the tickets, what are the priorities of the tickets, um, what is the severity, how long have they been out, etc. Looking at the test results, you also want to know how many languages and regions are you testing. So if you ship in, let's say, your Facebook or Google, the average number of languages between those two is about 100 languages, and chances are there's actual testing going on in probably less than half of those. I would say probably maybe 20 to 50 or so. So there might be 50 or so that are not tested. So the John Oliver episode I was thinking of when Tex happened to put this in was a case where he brought up automatic machine translations that Facebook had done for the different regions that they were going into, and they were going into Burma. And they did the automatic machine translation of the user agreement. And as you're reading through the user agreement, the machine translation actually flipped the meaning of some of the terms so that it was no longer um, a breach of the user agreement to blast another uh, group or, or hate crimes or whatever online. So it actually flipped the things around. It's got a great episode on that uh, that was in place. A, a lesser one that I had at one company, it was at a game company, and there, um, a game was coming out with a new feature. They were going to celebrate Bastille Day. And they had to get out, wait, we have to release it tomorrow. And they forgot to come back to the, the uh, globalization team. And they said, oh, we, we don't want to wait. So they went and did Google Translate for Bastille Day. And it didn't go over too well in France, the intended market. So we had to go back and fix that. Um, so that comes into how many languages and regions are actually tested to be sure that you're, you have a good coverage. So what you're looking for is there is certain behavior that your product has, and that behavior might be the same across a whole lot of markets. So for the functional testing, if you know that you've been able to test the behavior correctly, then you can cover a wide range by testing a smaller number of regions from a functional point of view. But from the linguistic point of view, you want to be sure all the variations are tested or looked at over time. So your KPIs then become testing, the, the coverage and the automation percent that you can do. So with the automation testing, you should be able to test as many markets as possible. So you can test all the different variations and things. So when I work at uh, a team or a product that has got different regulatory rules, if there's one rule that crosses multiple markets, if I test one country that has that rule, then I know I've tested the behavior of that rule in place from an automation point of view that is not the same as the linguistic testing. But the idea is that you want to go, how can I get the maximum coverage of the functionality for automation testing? And then you have another percentage, which is the max the coverage you have for the linguistic testing. <clears throat> so as you go out to market, there are things that engineers invariably never actually take a look at. And that's what I call last mile testing. And this is where you have an engineer who's built a product. He has a development machine 
with six CPUs on his desk and uh, eight gigabytes of RAM on the machine with a gigabyte back <coughs> to the servers that run the whole system and the thing just is beautiful. <laughs> then you give it to the user who's on a smartphone in Tamil Nadu and he starts bringing up the app and then he goes and makes some chai for family and then sits down with a meal with a few chapatis and then comes back, reads a story to his kids and he comes back and the app is almost loaded. So the last mile testing is really important. There's a number of ways in which that can be done as part of an organization. One is, um, so one example is, how many of you have got um, remote development that's either in China or India? Um, so I'm guessing about a third of you, and some of you didn't raise your hand, but they, the companies that if you're not working for a company, you may work for one that does, you can easily set up a lab that is hooked up to a local Ethernet drop, and then you're able to set up test machines that are then able to access your servers. So you work with your IT people to work out a coordinated firewall to get through, but you're testing the real bandwidth for the real application in the real location so that you want to do a worldwide release and half the world can't use it because you didn't do last mile testing. So this is something that has, is, has to be in place. And your KPI is latency. How long does it take to use the product in real life locally versus in simulated life in a lab? And how many tickets that you generate? A product goes out and a customer has an issue, how do you support the customer? This is another KPI. So you have two things which are, do you have customer support in the local language of the user? And if you don't, do you have some mechanism to get it from the local language into a language you can support? So that's a place where you see a lot of machine translation helping with um, dialogue translation. Another place that helps even more is if you have a large body of tickets from previous customers, those can be used to be able to build up um, radio dialogue and search for the FAQs where a customer can say, I have, this is some issue dealing with login, login. So here's a list of issues I can read in my link. I have this issue. And then they could perhaps attach a few, tell me something about your issue, and then use machine translation to get some help with that. Um, the other one is, are, do you actually have the local phone support and so on? And is that actually in the content that the customer can get? The other thing you look at with your customer support is the number of tickets that come in from the local regions. You want to be able to say, we have this issue, or well, what region did it come from? What language did it come from? Can we point to the product and where that's actually existing? The final bit, in as you do in your deployment, with the customer support issues is a customer wants to use a product, how many times, what's the rejection rate on a regional basis? So oftentimes uh, companies look at the onboarding rate or the adoption rate of their product, how fast and how many users are coming up. The other thing you want to be able to track is the <coughs> rejection rate, how many people went to your product and then stopped and then be able to find out where are they stopping, why are they stopping, and can you get anyone to get more information about that or instrument it even more to be able to find out why they're stopping in that place. So the rejection rate is actually important. The engagement rate, how long do people stay on your product on a per market basis. The uh, net promoter score, which comes up, this is a tricky one because the net promoter score is usually done with a shadow box. It'll come up on an application with a survey, answer a few questions. And the trouble with that is surveys are cultural too. So when you go across different regions, uh, if you have a choice of five choices from high to low, there are some regions where it'll either be at the top or it'll be at the bottom. Or you'll be like, in Germany, they say perfect, nothing is perfect. And so they always do one down. <laughs> and then you go to, and so, so there's, there's actual science to net promoter score to get actual useful scores, going from region to region. And then there are companies that provide, help you with um, uh, multilingual sentiment analysis, 
what are people saying on Twitter about you in a language that you can't read? And is it good or is it bad? And there's various good terms and bad terms uh, that can be actually brought in as part of the scores for your product and its adoption. So putting this all together, converting this into scores that then can be brought up to the management level. And some of you have heard me say this before that the three most important languages that you need to know are not like French, German, and Japanese, but they're executive manager and engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so the engineer, you need to know bits and bytes, these are the APIs that you use. The manager, you need to know in terms of this is the effort and the cost to do this right. The executive is, tell me in five minutes what's wrong and who do I point my finger at? <laughs> so that's what the KPIs, in essence, happen, is that you're taking data that's come from the engineer level and, and the manager level to something that an executive can go, we have a problem here and we need to correct it. We have an issue that our customers are saying we have a poor brand and a poor experience and they can't use our product, but I want to have a global product. An executive can then say, let's take action on this or not. So getting these um, organized, that's why Tex was saying, get it down to simple colors, red, yellow, green. So that's American colors, but they're effective still. They understand red means warning, not lucky red envelope for Chinese New Year, but red, <laughs> yellow, green. Um, also getting it down to overall scores so that you can say, um, these are thresholds that I have. And then if you need to break it down into, these are engineering threshold, this is quality, localization quality threshold, this is customer support thresholds. And then if they want to start diving down or tell the managers below them to dive down into it, that hopefully you can drill down in. There's great products out to help with visualization of that, like um, Tableau and diving into your databases and so on. That, can help you with visualization, data viz, et cetera. So several companies have done this. So taking the KPIs and putting them into dashboards. So one example is um, a project, joint project I did when I was at Yahoo and did with my uh, associates at Autodesk and Adobe. We took all of the things that we saw, thought were important KPIs and put them into a single table broken down by major areas depending on the phase of where you were in the product. We're either in the planning stage, design page, phase, engineering phase, and looking at major categories where we knew there were issues that if they weren't considered could impact the quality of the product. And then from there, those would end up with scores and then we assigned them by role of who those were most important to. We, it got pretty elaborate. We put in weightings by region and adjustability and so on. And we had all these calculations using um, JavaScript uh, calculations under the covers on Google Sheets. And then Google removed the ability to use... Uh, Google. Yes, Google. <laughs> <laughs> Google removed the ability to use JavaScript inside the Google Sheets, so all of our calculations broke. But the, the overall categories still make sense in terms of there are areas that if you are not looking at them, you risk the potential, you have a risk to your company from a global point of view. Example, not doing all of them. We take content and various potential things that become requirements for your content. Is the content uh, available worldwide is the content designed for a global audience, not a single U.S. audience. If there's user-generated data or user moderation, do you take into consideration that there's are there legal requirements in terms of <coughs> privacy? Do you have to search for um, various swear words or what I call scatological terms? For multilingual content, uh, what uh, are the official languages that have to be in place? So let's say I have a product that's going out and a government wants to purchase it, if I want to go to the UK, Welsh will be on this list. If I support Welsh, I have a much better chance of being chosen by the, the British government than if I had just English. The content library localization process, so on, so on various, various categories and then a requirement, categories and a requirement. And those become things that can come back to the teams and you say, 
look, I'm not pushing waterfall development on you, but I'm pushing quality on you. And these need to be things that are taken into consideration. If you need to take these requirements and turn them into user stories for verification that they're in the product, then turn them into user stories for verification of the requirements. Other companies have produced dashboards. So this is one from a company several of you have probably uh, talked to, and either within your company or otherwise. They're based in Colorado, and they built a real solid, uh, very, um, it goes very deep and wide for identifying internationalization issues in strongly typed code, and they've recently added some capabilities to use artificial intelligence to learn what are potential issues in different code. And so they break it down into where the potential issues are, allows you to drill down into the code itself and identify them, and then once they're um, identified, bring them out. And then this is keyed to a localization process dashboard for where are you in the localization process going forward. What is local system? What's that? What is local system? Ah, so these, I'm going to detail for a long time. Locale sensitive methods. So when a, let's say you're working in Java and I need to print a string out, I can use the standard system date time to generate the date, or I use a proper um, locale, uh, a locale formatter that prints it based on the locale that I'm in. And so if I'm using it, one that's not enabled for locales, then I'm not using a locale sensitive method. So if I clicked into this, it would open up a list of areas in code that are using things that are suspect and would probably not work across multiple locales for the formatting. Good question. Um, when I was at Yahoo, this is a KPI dashboard that we built. This one was based on a survey. So we had someone who was assigned, um, we had an architect assigned to each one of the major divisions at PayPal, I mean at Yahoo, I'm at PayPal now, at Yahoo, <laughs> and they actually went through a survey and asked questions depending on the process that they're in, are you doing the localization testing, how are you using the right APIs and so on, and with that we're able to build up a score on the results that came back. This was not as effective as I'd like it to be because since it was survey based, you end up them interviewing someone who's not interested in doing the survey, and they can game the system and say, yes, 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 I did all of it, and we have a great product. So I prefer things that are automated, that actually look at the code itself, that actually scan the code itself, and look at the content itself. The more automation, the better. Another one, this one, I forget if this is at Adobe or at Autodesk. They actually do a number of uh, tests that are looking at certification of internationalization issues, or looking at content issues and so on, and those are building up scores, and the scores are based on the number of tickets across various products. And then based on those, they come up with a final result on a per product basis. And then with that, they'll do like a scatter plot to look at what the number of issues are on a per product. So this is three different products and then spread out across a range of issues. So it's a little blurry to you, but that's okay because it's the idea that counts in terms of uh, being able to visualize the information in a way that can be perceived by someone at the executive or manager level. So benefits, why do you want to have KPIs and dashboards and testing? So that you are confident of the outcome based on the data. It's not based on someone's gut feeling. It meets the specs of what you put into the requirements, and it forces customer acceptance and forces you to look at known pitfalls. So you are, you are acting as an advocate for the customer worldwide. Early detection allows mid-course correction. So something we have in the valley is fail fast, fail fast. Or, or what did Mark Zuckerberg say? It's like, um, uh, I want to go fast and break stuff. And, but the idea that you want to be able to break things early, but you want to break it on your side, not on the customer side. Also, it gives you reliability. The final QA confirms that you did it right. It doesn't correct it. So there is testing and there's QA. 
most of the industry, they're trying to blur together, mean the same thing. But quality assurance, make sure you're doing it right the first time. Testing, uh, so that what that does is that prevents the issues, and the testing then detects the issues that you didn't catch because your QA, your quality process, isn't working right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when you hear testing and QA, you say, well, wait a second. Which side of the wall are we talking about? The quality side should be on the de design, development, requirement side of the wall. Testing is on the I'm almost ready to release side of the wall. And they should the testing is injected back in to the quality side so I can be able to prevent the issues so that when the testing comes out, I want it to be clean on the other side. The historic data allows you for process improvements. So in an iterative cycle such as you have an agile development, you have real data to be able to come back at the end of an epic, as Tex had for those little control things, to come back and do continuous improvement. I found something wrong, let's improve it. I found something wrong, let's improve it. And so you continue to increase overall in your quality. So we tried to present you the facts and no fake news tonight. Okay. You're going to get a toss so, that was an intentional, right? Joe, how much time do we have? <laughs> time enough to draw New Zealand? <laughs> At least 10 minutes. That's John Oliver's map. I'll blame it on him. Thank you. Um, this is a very powerful set of presentations and very, very exciting that we can keep improving. And one of the things that we came out of this is to fully understand nothing's perfect. Things are always changing. So the machines will never take over. We keep improving them, and we have to keep on improving them. Right? It's so it's so very exciting. We'll always have a job. They're just not going to be perfect. Right. But thank you, yeah. So we, do, we will always have a job, right? <laughs> Finding the problems and fixing them. Just, just to talk about the, I, I read this wonderful thing. It just says somebody had a lecture at Elia in Fran, in um, Barcelona, I think, just last week, um, and he said uh, we're not going to lose uh, jobs to the robots. We're going to lose jobs to the people who control and build the robots. <laughs> so I think that's a much better way of understanding it. But I do have a question. <laughs> I was wondering if you have experience with chatbots and all the things that can possibly go wrong with them and possible KPIs or what I to do with chatbots. I don't exactly have specific personal experience with chatbots, but I have um, worked with setting requirements for teams that are dealing with chatbots. So for those of you who aren't aware, so what, what a lot of companies do is they set up They'll use customer service to set up uh, a chat box, either that's for text, and they also have a voice recognition chat box. And the key with those is to be able to have dialogue well written in terms of understanding categories of terms. So, for instance, IBM's Watson is used for a lot of building a uh, number of the better chat boxes and so on. But the issue is, uh, like I talk to the teams, and they say, oh, no problem, we'll just get it translated. And, well, there is a problem because the way in which you engage in a conversation is different when you go from region to region. So the teams at IBM understand how to do that, but it's, it's, it's fraught with potential errors and pitfalls when going into other regions. So what happened, like some of the, the talks we had with um, um, Alexa, for instance, is doing the feedback for the team that own, that runs the Alexa, uh, listening, or, or, or diagnosing what people are asking and when they're not getting and not getting what they want and how do they need to constantly improve. So the, the uh, so you have issues with the chatting in text when it comes up on a screen. And that has to be able to recognize that a user is having a query and be able to semantically break it down into pieces. And that can be done fairly well with the current natural language processing tools that are in place to semantically break it into dilemmas, individual ideas, and so on. 
and then be able to put it into a problem category. But then it's having the intelligent response back to say, it looks like you're asking about da 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 da. Uh, is that right? And so you're asking for an affirmative negative, and then they go yes, and then they continue on, can you tell me more? And then you get some more keywords to go a little bit deeper into the issue. So it's being able to define, and a lot of it has to do with actually working with real customer service agents to see how do they go through their dialogues, and then is that human dialogue working in other regions, because it oftentimes doesn't. And have you had issues with those? Yes, but only as a user. <laughs> no, I thought you were answering this. Yes. You go first. Um, uh, I really, I really enjoyed the uh, comprehensive testing process that you introduced to us. Because um, as a localization student, we don't get to know the testing process a lot. Um, I think that's very interesting. I have two questions for you. One is more straightforward. What are the tools that you're using to do those uh, tests? Like the code scans, what are the tools that you're using, if there's any? So the industry tool that I was talking about is called Lingoport. So I can talk about them because PayPal does not use them. <laughs> if, they, if, they were, if we were using it, I wouldn't tell you because it would be a proprietary information. But, the other tools that we use is uh, PayPal does a lot, like for us, we do a lot of our effort is uh, written in Jode and, uh, Node and JavaScript. And we actually write our own scanners for what we consider to be good code. And the, a lot of the stuff is built on top of um, Perl or um, standard uh, things that you use for doing natural language processing. And we're looking for uh, we, we work with the linguist to say, what are the patterns that you see as a problem again and again? And we go, okay, this is an issue. Let's write a scanner across the source content. And then we know that there are particular APIs in the code that we say people should be using this, this, and this. Where can we find uh, the libraries that we say are not approved? And we'll scan for those in the code. And then, uh, so we actually are building our own tools for those. But then we plug it into um, for instance, um, Reza over here on our team, he built a plugin that goes into something called ESLint, which is a quality checker that all developers use when they're working in JavaScript, or should be using. And so it's plugged in as part of that, and so they can, they can throttle on and off how much they want to listen to the, the internationalization errors they have. But then we've taken that same thing and plugged it into um, back-end scanners so that we can go ahead and look, even if the developers aren't, to see how high or how low the number of issues being found are. So the, do you other tools? Um, there, there are a few, quite a few actually, open source tools out there. Um, I, don't, I don't have particular ones to recommend. I was going to mention the excellent. But um, like PayPal and, and Mike's group, I think um, by the time you're done learning other tools and integrating them um, and trying to figure out how to eliminate false positives and what it, whatever those tools are doing, I think for a lot of companies it makes sense to do what PayPal is doing, which is to create their own. You start with, um, what are the basics that I want to look for? I mean, some of these tools do a good job for some really advanced things, but by the time you um, figure out the kinds of mistakes your developers make in the kinds of code they write. It, it falls into categories of patterns of, of writing code, which tend to be repeated throughout the organization. Um, it's like a local organizational culture. And by the time you tweak these other tools um, to work well with that type of code, I find that it works pretty well to just have people in-house um, direct them to write their own scanners. And they've already got build tools and some automation around the build um, that they can do and comply. It may not catch all of the things these other tools do, but by the time you go through the effort to, to uh, address how those other tools work, you, you know what you're getting and it works for your code. So um, there are trade-offs there. Uh, Lingoport does a, a really good job, um, but you're going to have to put some work into whatever you use in mm -hmm. order to uh, make it work well for your organization. 
Okay, thank you. That's pretty cool. I have a second question. Um, so, sorry, uh, but I'm really curious about um, this this problem, uh, this question. Uh, you mentioned a lot of. Um, it seems that you have a well-established process, testing process, uh, and for ev for every test, you will get a result of the errors that you get. Um, for some of the errors, you can fix it by uh, coding, by engineering, but for some that. But for others, you cannot fix it by just engineering. Um, so I'm thinking, when will the localization team get involved to fix those issues? Do you want to take that one? Or? Well, I think there, there are several levels to this question of, um, well, we're finding problems, and maybe it's not an engineering problem. So sometimes. Um, based on time constraints, you might ask the localization team, say, well, can you translate around it or localize around it? Um, and sometimes and that's where the root cause analysis comes in. Maybe it's, it's earlier upstream, it's in the design or how your architects are developing the code. So um, the big picture is to figure out why you have a problem that you can't address easily and to then, and you can't always predict and catch these things. Sometimes, especially if you're innovating and doing something completely new, you run into situations that nobody was going to anticipate. But to the extent that it could have been anticipated, then figure out where in the process that should be addressed and, and you learn from it. Not everything's going to have an instantaneous fix. I'm not sure if that, does that address your question or it's too hand waving and. So I, I mentioned too here that <clears throat> the internationalization testing is testing the code. So I kind of glossed over this, which, uh, uh, but you've got there's three major kinds of testing. There's internationalization testing is the code okay. There's the linguistic testing, which is uh, is the translation actually correct? So the term that I've heard a lot is. Uh, TEP, translate, edit, proof, that you don't usually want to have the same person do all three. Oftentimes it happens that way because it's cheaper, but that's the linguistic testing. This is actually the correct translation. And then we, I usually call cosmetic testing, which is how does the translation look in the context of the product itself? And that's where the linguist and the, the localizer comes in as well. And then the third one is once you've deployed, uh, you get issues that happens in a region, and that goes to like a localization manager because it's in that language. And then they'll bring a linguist in to say, is this a translation problem? Is this a content problem? Is this an engineering problem? And then they'll be running around to figure out what the root cause is and if they need to bring a developer in or not. So they're involved quite a lot in that area. I think just one other comment. I, there are actually several other kinds of, of testing, unit mm -hmm. testing and the like, but um, a key aspect, if you're working in globalization, is to establish accountability, right? Because you can have problems where everybody's finger pointing and for saying, well, I'll leave that problem for the next <coughs> stage, which is why a lot of the localization folks end up dealing with, with, with many problems, that some of which are unfixable, right? But um, Holding the developers accountable, the designers, the product marketers accountable, holding their managers accountable. Um, at all of those stages, if you don't have some level of accountability, which the KPA, KPI help you um, to bring back to uh, these individuals or at least to the roles. Um, if you don't have accountability, then you're always going to have the problem. No matter what you measure, the problems are always going to just trickle forward. So I don't know if that, that helps. Could I see the previous slide? This one? Yeah, thanks. Okay. So you got I, I the two super important. Yeah, exactly. It's supposed to be a, a slow dissolve. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Are developers more well, or less... There's the microphone. Oh, okay, thank you. Are developers more or less aware that they need to make sure the code is good for globalization when they're trying to build a product in the beginning? Because I feel like there's a paradox there. Because as a startup, you don't think going global at, at the beginning. So you just want to make sure you hit the market as soon as possible-ish. But 
Uh, am I Sorry. clear? No, developers usually are not aware of their <laughs> acquisition. Um, I have found, out of all the different teams I've been on, and all the different people that I've hired, people I know in the industry, I only know of one person who went to school and specifically learned internationalization as part of their career. It's not offered, usually it's not offered in universities, there's only like three courses around the country, I think, that even is mentioned. So develop, developers don't know. When they do a Hello World, they do a Hello World in English for the U.S. only. Hard so coming. we have to do a complete re-education with them. So the way that to make it work in a developer organization is you try to make it as painless as possible. And the way to do that is you work with whoever the technical leads are to say, I, don't care. I know you guys are going to do what you want to that's fast and prototype and get it out quick, but please, please, please use this software library for anything that's going to go to the screen. You're still going to break a bunch of other stuff, but please use this, and that will help get a lot farther. And so it's good to know what, what some of the best solutions are. When the companies go global, would they usually have an overhaul of all the codes? Ideally, no. No, that's why, actually, well, yes, that's why Texas got such a great career. <laughs> I don't always come in after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think it varies from, from company and you know, vary within organizations with com within the company. Yeah. So the companies like PayPal and, and large companies, they train their engineers on internationalization. So um, they may not come into the company with that knowledge, but um, they should get it and uh, either through you know organizational training or their manager should be directing them. But that's where accountability uh, becomes important as well as leadership. Because you have organizations where they talk about being global. CEO has it on his slides every quarter. <laughs> Everybody's laughing because we've all been through this. And then down at the team level, they're going, get it out the door. Right. So, to the issue. Thank you. I think you know, just for history's sake, we need to remember that you know, there was a long time ago, they never even imagined hiring like we're talking at Pex, and uh, in, uh, I forget when it was, like 2007 or so, we had a talk by somebody from PayPal that said, you know, in 2004 we finally said we've had enough. We need to internationalize. PayPal until then, from the late 90s, it just, we just, we need to launch, we need to launch, we need to launch. And in about 2004, somebody said, why are all these strings hard-coded in here? And, and they, they said, we have to redo it. So they rewrote everything. Just rewrote everything and, and, and rebuilt. And so PayPal has done this too. Yeah, so the, so the funny thing is, it's, it's too bad you guys weren't here 10 years ago, because you, you come into an IMUG meeting and um, somebody from one of the big companies, and I, I won't name their names, but this, this would happen almost every month. They would come in and say, we discovered internationalization. We invented our whole new process. Let's, we're going to tell you about it. And it's the most basic stuff for which the 20 or 30 of us at the time sitting in there were going, we know all this. Why are you, you're inventing it and also you're doing it wrong. <laughs> oh, every month. It's like we have a whole new Startups. We've had a couple of meetings where yeah. first, there were some things missing as, as well. Here, but, um, anyway, yeah. finally, so, uh, question. Thank you. So I have two questions. One is again about developer. So how do you implement uh, your tools? At what stage? I mean, as soon as the developer code, uh, do you put some gate that he cannot deliver the code? Your tools work at what level? And it's nightly build or weekly? Uh... Um, OK, so if, I integrating tools into the development environment is a social decision. Because any time that you interrupt a developer's idea of the perfect for the development environment that they built, you run into pushback. So um, what we're working on, my team, is at PayPal, the developer um, creates their build, and then they do it using GitHub, they do a check-in, and then Jenkins is under the, the covers, and there's various things that have to happen before they're allowed to complete the, um, the pull request, and then it has to pass a certain ghost build and so on. We're working 
with the, the core teams at PayPal to try and inject in the tests so that at a pull request time, it goes in and does a minimum set of internationalization tests to be able to generate logs. Right now, we're keeping at the logs level because in internationalization code scanning, you get tons of false positives. And it would get rejected right off the bat if those false positives are stopping the developer from checking in. The other thing that we've done is um, one member from our team, he's left already, uh, created uh, pseudo localization and injected that into the core sample app that all additional apps are built on top of. Right now it's optional. And then they were going to be flipping it so that it's opt out instead of opt in. So this is based on experience that we've had and also encouragement from our friends at Netflix that did something similar. So that when a developer creates an app, they put the source in, they're going to see pseudo-translated API coming out. So it becomes just part of the build. Because one of the key principles we have is <coughs> English is just another language. So you shouldn't be surprised if you see something different on your screen, but you'll still be able to read the English. So it's, I don't know if I quite answered that question, but uh, it's, if, if you slow a developer down, or you stop their development for something that isn't really a problem for them, it will get removed right away. So you have to make it as painless as possible. Right. So my next question is for the pseudo localization automation. So have you implemented and are you getting a good results? What is the success uh, around it? So we have built three different versions of pseudo localization to simulate um, uh, European content, right to left content, and uh, Asian content. And the, um, this is one of the cases where we got pushback from the teams. They said, you're stopping our development when we just throw it over the fence and get the translations back. So that's why we've implemented it back into the core development process. And so I can't speak to PayPal, but I can speak to other companies I was at. Uh, a particular game company I worked at, where we did implement the pseudo -lo localization and then used OCR to do the analysis, and we had um, real good results with that. Um, I would encourage you to go to the Netflix talk that's in April, May, April, April, and you'll hear a lot more about that. I, I would imagine they would mention it. They always do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So somewhere along the way, though. Um, uh, you need to have the ability to push back on the urgency of getting the letting the developers get their code through because if they're also causing problems and causing iterations and the like, then um, you can direct management and engineering to say, no, you have to pay attention to this because it's not ignorable and we can't fix it later. So um, somewhere in there, you have to remember why you asked for it in the first place. Is it time or more? Yeah. One question. Merle's yeah. the last question. Absolutely. Merle gets the last word. It's kind of like when the fat lady sings. Merle asks his last question. Um, so uh, she said something in, in your presentation that I almost stood up and applauded for because I thought it for a long time, and I've never heard anybody else say it. Um, and that is that uh, programmers should not be writing text. Full stop. Yeah, I will stand up now and applaud. <laughs> So while I agree with the principle, have you actually ever done it? And has it worked? How does it work? Um, yeah, there are some companies where, um, as a part of the design of the software, the product marketing folks will say, here's the text that has to happen. At some point, you get some number of error messages where they leave it to the developers. But you know, a lot of the text could be laid out by either professional authors or the marketing folks, because it gives. Um, Consistency throughout the product. They define terminology up front, uh, that are, so you don't have encyclopedia in one place, repository in another place. And so um, some companies do this, especially the ones that you know are very focused on user experience um, and spend a lot of energy on that. And especially these days, where you have um, maybe different UX on your different kinds of cell phone systems as well as desktop and web. They might um, have folks who are, since they're spending the energy on the UX and they want to have a good user experience, um, they'll spend time on the language. But there's always some level where, um, where 
where they leave it up to the developers because they think it's too geeky. And you know, some of the stuff actually, users should never see some of the messages. They only pop up because they're diagnostic in addition to whatever the high level message was. So. And the second part of that is this is just a thought. You don't have to respond if you want to, but, but uh, writing for user interface elements is, has a lot in common with writing in general. And it seems to me that that needs to be supported with a terminology, glossary, term base, whatever, and with a style guide, buttons or verbs, and those kinds of things that, um, and you know, like how many characters for the widths, and this and that, all that needs to go into the style. So if they have the terminology and they have the style and they have a really good person doing it, it might actually work out well. It's just, just a random thought. It, it, the more planning you put up front, um, the less cost you're gonna spend iterating later on, but of course, um, especially with Agile and people's attitudes today, it's getting in the user's hands because we want the experience first, so there's that trade-off as well. But somewhere in the process, you say, all right, let's get some professionals to deal with it. So. that it? Okay. Well, I'm sure you made it. We're cartoon characters, are we supposed to go, that's all, folks? <laughs>